So thank you, Alex, for reaching out for this talk. Thank you, everybody, uh, for being here. So uh, I will talk about, as Alex said already uh, 15 minutes ago, about lamination in the retina and the interplay of diverse migration modes during this process. And while I'm now at the Gulbenkian Institute in Oeiras, a lot of this data has been accumulated in Dresden still, because in pandemic we didn't uh, manage yet. Now it's going better to do uh, to get to full speed in Oeiras. So when we think about the retina, of course, it's a very important organ. It's a very important part of the central nervous system because the retina is really where vision begins. And the retina is the part of the brain that allows us to perceive our environment, to perceive color and contrast. And of course, the retina has to um, connect to the brain, to the visual cortex, but it is an outpost of the central nervous system by itself. And to generate vision, the different neurons in the retina need to be correctly positioned. And uh, this positioning is very important for information flow. You have the apical photoreceptors that are the cells that collect the light. Then via bipolar cells, this light information is transmitted to the retinal ganglion cells. These are actually the cells that make the optic nerve. And then you have these interneurons, horizontal cells, which this talk will concentrate on, and emocrine cells that uh, transmit and also adjust the information that goes through this information flow. And obviously, to have this information flow correctly, it's very important that these cells are in the right order. And this is probably also why, why in diurnal animals, from zebrafish to humans, this order is very conserved. And what is, however, also true is that lamination in the retina is very complex. And this is something that has been not studied a lot so far, because you have these first steps of the retinal ganglion cells, which are relatively straightforward. It's a process of somal translocation. The cells go from the apical side where they are born to the basal side, make an axon and thereby the optic nerve. But from this first step, it becomes more complicated. You have these two types of bi-directionally migrating cells, photoreceptors and horizontal cells. You have uh, bipolar cells and emocrine cells occurring at the same time. And uh, all of this happens in parallel. So it's not that you have like in the cortex and inside out uh, lamination, but everything happens more or less at the same time. And what we know so far and what people have studied so far is the gene regulatory networks that underlie this, uh, the specification of the different neurons. We have lineage studies to understand which neurons are born at which time point. And of course, recently we also gathered a lot of single sequencing data. What is not as well understood, however, how this is spatially coordinated, and even more importantly, how this is orchestrated on the tissue level. Because it's very unlikely that these cells all migrate in isolation, but they have to kind of influence each other during their migration. And lamination is very important because when you have defects in neuronal lamination in the retina, this leads to de vision defects. You have this dysplastic retinas in some conditions, where you have these rosettes of neurons forming. But despite this importance, there's very few studies that really, very few studies that really try to understand the lamination in the retina from cells to tissue. And this is what my lab tries to figure out in many different projects. And the way we do this, as Alex already alluded to, is that we uh, use a lot of imaging, mainly for these type of studies, because they're very long-term light sheet imaging. This is an example. This is one from one of our first studies where we uh, looked at the retinal ganglion cells. And of course, here the zebrafish is a fantastic model organism because it allows us really to zoom in at the single cell level. And what we get out is an analysis of the stereotypicity, plasticity of the processes that we're interested in. And we can also look at tissue scale phenomena because we can really image the whole process from beginning to the end. And the two cell types that we have been concentrating on in the last years were the photoreceptors and the horizontal cells because they undergo this very intriguing and sort of counterintuitive bidirectional migration going first towards uh, basal directions and then back to the apical side. And uh, both of these studies have been put on the bioarchives. I will not talk about the photoreceptors for the limits of time, but I will concentrate today on the horizontal cell migration. And what you can see in this movie is that horizontal cell migration is very complex. So all these green cells are horizontal cells. You see that they first go down, then they go up again. And maybe already in this movie, you can appreciate 
that none of these cells does it really in the same way. And this is the first study where we just characterized, or just where we characterized the movement of these cells, which was done by Rana Amini. Also, the second study was done by Rana Amini in the lab. And what she found is that these migration, these cells migrate in very different depths. So they can go very basal or they can stay quite shallow. They, as opposed to most other neurons in the retina, also do three-dimensional migration. So they don't only go up and down, but they also move to the left, right, and also into the tissue and coming out of the tissue again. And what is also different between these cells and the other neurons that we observe in the retina is their migration takes very, very long. So for example, the retinal ganglion cells that we studied first, migration takes two to four hours. Here we talk about up to 20 hours. But what is very important was our finding that the, the migration behavior is really non-predictable. These cells more or less behave like snowflakes. They, no, we didn't find a single cell that does it exactly like another cell. And one reason for this could be that these cells actually move through a very, very crowded tissue. So you can see this here. This is at the stage when the cells move. This is a zoom in. You can see this is a nuclear envelope marker. This is a cell membrane marker. You can hardly imagine how these cells move at all because all the tissue is actually occupied by other developing or already differentiating neurons. And this also is shown in this movie. When you look at this cell, it really seems to have a hard time finding its way, going left and right, up and down through this very, very crowded environment. And it's a little bit reminiscent pre-pandemic times when you were getting out of the subway in a very crowded subway station. So all these people that exit the subway want to go to the stairs and go to the road, but all of them will do it in a slightly different way. They will use slightly different amounts of time, but in the end, they all end up at the road where they want to be, which is the same for the horizontal cells, which all in the end end up beneath the photoreceptor cell layer, but they do it in different ways. So how do they move? Not the people, but the horizontal cells again. So migration in crowded tissue has been uh, shown to occur in two different ways. You can either have space generation, for example, seen for mesenchymal cells, where you have uh, protease activity or ECM degradation, fibroblasts and certain tumor cells use this method. Or you can have strategies of space adaptation, which is called amoeboid-like migration, where the cells undergo frequent direction changes, the cell shape changes, and also you see a lot of nuclear deformations. So Rana looked at both these possibilities, and what she noticed is that it's very unlikely that these cells degrade the underlying ECM, because in the region where these cells migrate, there is no ECM. Here I show you hyaluronic acid and laminin. We also looked at other ECM components, and during migration, there's really no significant amount of ECM around these cells. What she did see, however, is that these cells indeed um, undergo frequent deformation at the cellular and at the nuclear level. So uh, you can see in green, you can see a nuclear envelope marker. Uh, in magenta, you can see a nuclear envelope marker, and in green, the whole cell. And you can see these cells really change their shape frequently. And we looked at many different uh, parameters, the elongation rate ratio, the parameter, and you can see that they are and others, and you can see that they're constantly fluctuating. In addition, what Rana also observed was that these cells can circumvent obstacles. For example, here you have this mitotic cell that is in the way of the horizontal cell moving towards its final position beneath the photoreceptor cell layer. And you can see that it really circumvents it. And once it left, leaves it behind, it elongates again towards the direction of movement. So what we concluded is that these cells really undergo more amoeboid-like migration um, without any processes, they move through the tissue and they do this by direction changes, cell shape changes, and nuclear deformations. And at least to our knowledge, this is one of the first times that amoeboid-like migration has been shown in the developing central nervous system. How do these cells probe the environment? We don't have final answers for this, but we have uh, indications. We have these actin-filled protrusions that are um, that are thrown in different directional directions and with different directionality. However, during the uh, longest time of migration, the direction of the migration and the direction of these protrusions does not always correlate. 
So when we look at all the different speeds, there's no correlation between the direction of protrusions. Sometimes, like in this example, they also throw two, they throw two protrusions. So we think that the protrusive activity might not be directly involved in the migration, but more to find the direction of migration and find directional cues. However, at this point, we do not yet know what these cues are. What we also see is that uh, there are limits to the space adaptation. And what we already found in the first um, study is that you have these plexiform layers that I didn't mention before. The plexiform layers are layers that are occupied by the neurites of the um, different neurons, by the axons and the dendrites. And this, of course, is a very, um, very dense meshwork. And what Rana noticed in the early story is that before you have the emergence of the plexiform layer, the horizontal cells go beneath the what will become the plexiform layer. But once it is established, these horizontal cells stay above the plexiform layer. However, at this stage, it was correlation. So we wanted to ask in a more directed way whether the plexiform layer could be a limiting factor for space adaptation. And to do this, we used a genetic trick where we removed the retinal ganglion cells using an atonal um, 7 morpholino. And uh, this does not completely abolish, but it delays plexiform layer formation. And what we notice in this condition is that we see horizontal cells, again in green, that go much more basal than what we see in the control. And at late stages of development, when in the control all the horizontal cells have reached their final location beneath the photoreceptor cell layer, we see a lot of horizontal cells trapped beneath the plexiform layer. You can also see this here in the control. We never see them trapped beneath the plexiform layer at this stage of development, where we see a lot of them in the morpholino condition. And I don't have time to show you the movie, but we also have live imaging where these cells try to bump against the plexiform layer, but they cannot get through. So summary of this short delayed talk, and I apologize again, is that Quantitative analysis revealed that horizontal cell movement is non-stereotypic. So these cells really move very individually. They move in a very crowded uh, environment using space adaptation strategies. They undergo amoeboid-like migration. As I said, we are not aware of another example in the developing central nervous system where this migration type uh, is, uh, is encountered. However, now that we found it, probably it will also be found in different uh, contexts. And there are limits to space adaptation, which can be induced by the plexiform layer. What we don't know yet and what we're working on in the future is what the molecular guiding cues are so that lead to successful positioning. And also, we do not know what exactly is sensed in the tissue and whether, for example, the tissue microenvironment could play a role to guide these cells that always, even though doing it very individually, reach the correct position at the end of their migration part, at least in the control. And with this, I stop. I thank my uh, lab members. So different people work on different parts of the lamination. What I presented today was done by um, Rana Mini, very talented postdoc in the lab. If I'm not incorrect, she's also here in the room. So Rana, maybe you can uh, join for the chat and answer all the questions that might still be there. All the collaborators at IGC and also still in Dresden and my funding bodies. Thank you for your patience and I'm happy to take any questions. Great, thank you, Great. Karen. Beautiful talk. Um, let's see, Q and A. What have we got? Flavio Celesi asks, why do you think um, horizontal cells are not able to cross the IPL? Would there be a repulsive signal there, or maybe it is a mechanical barrier? So we believe we cannot exclude a repulsive signal. Uh, we haven't looked at all the repulsive signals that could be there, but uh, our interpretation also from the live imaging data is that it's more a mechanical barrier because these cells really move towards, as I said, they move towards the layer and they cannot pass through. So we see even indentations, they try to change their shape, but they cannot move through. And because it's so dense and they can move beyond before the plexiform layer is formed, we really assume that it's a mechanical barrier and thereby uh, yeah, this is this is the limit to the space adaptation, and it's probably the nucleus that cannot squeeze through the very small pores that the plexiform layer presents. Mm -hmm. I mean, to maybe follow up, I mean, do you see part of the cell trying to make it through and then it gets stuck because the nucleus is there or it never even tries? We don't have that resolution. We know that it bumps into the layer, but uh, we don't have the resolution to see if they maybe send some uh, podia through the pores. Uh, we would have to, in the light sheet, the light sheet is wonderful because you can do long-term imaging, 
but uh, you lose spatial resolution. This is, I, I cannot answer. I would intuitively say yes, but I cannot answer for sure. Yeah, yeah. Good. Maybe some other questions in the Q&A. And I mean, in the meantime, I mean, are these cells just more deformable than other cells? I mean, what, 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 what makes these cells so special? They just you can squeeze them more than other cells. They're softer. So, we don't think they're softer. I think the biggest difference, uh, which I didn't point out also for time reasons, is that these are the only cell types that move without uh, an attached apical or basal or both processes. And what we also know from this study and others is that all these cells actually have very low expression for lemon uh, of lemon AC. So lemon AC is the nuclear, pore, uh, nuclear envelope component that makes the nucleus more stiff. Um, and we think, and uh, there's also uh, experiments in the paper, Rana overexpressed lamin AC. And when we overexpress lamin AC, these cells have more problems. They still make it, but they have more problems to go to the apical side. So we think that all the cells in the developing retina are very deformable, but these cells make most use of it because they have to migrate without any attachment in this amoeboid like manner, while all the other neurons have mainly an apical attachment that guides them in a more one-dimensional uh, migration mode. Mm -hmm. uh, Andy Pauli has a question. Is the density of the tissue part of the reason that they migrate in a more amoebate-like manner? So is it really the density or the stiffness of the tissue? What, what, what do you think? We, we think yes, but uh, we, again, we cannot answer this because we would have to make holes and see if they change uh, their migration behavior and this uh, I wouldn't know how, and we haven't done it yet. Mm -hmm. 